Hello, my name's Dr James Gill and welcome back to my kitchen for... So we've talked about power, but how are we going to actually define power? Power is essentially the ability to overcome gravity. And it's important to remember that there are normal variations between people. Age, gender, fitness, occupation, all are going to affect power. And we need to keep that in mind during our examination. A crucial thing that might affect power actually is pain. Frequently seen in the a &E department, somebody's had a severe injury and we're not actually able to easily assess them because of that pain that they're feeling. So in terms of power, we're going to rate this with the Medical Research Council scale, going from five being normal power all the way down to zero. And you'll see that this is relatively straightforward, but has a few crucial bits to it. Normal power is just that. You'd expect the patient to be able to push and pull you as um, you'd expect. Um, so with grade five power, the patient is able to pull and push against you as you can on them, and you feel that their power is reasonable to yours. Grade four is they can do all the movements and things, and they can push against you, but they're just weaker than you'd expect. And that's the one part of the rating where it's slightly difficult to um, be confident in. Grade three power, you've got movement against gravity without resistance. So for example, the patient can flex and extend their arm, but if I was to put my hand there, they wouldn't be able to do it against me. With grade two, they can move, but not against gravity. So they wouldn't be able to pick up their arm, but if I could hold their arm, they could move it side to side for me. With grade one, they can't actually move the limb at all now, but they are able to contract the muscle. And grade zero, we've got no movement at all. Remember, weakness to the extensors in the upper limbs suggests an upper motor neuron lesion, whereas weakness to the flexors in the lower limb would also would suggest an upper motor neuron lesion. There are some conditions such as myasthenia gravis which affect power in a slightly different way. With myasthenia gravis, patients get tired, they fatigue easily. So we'll find that if a patient is saying that they get tired, they have difficulty doing repetitive movements. We'd test that, perhaps getting them to blink rapidly, and we'd expect to see that tiring by about 30 seconds duration. In terms of assessing power, remembering that upper motor neuron lesions will affect muscle groups, whereas lower motor neurons will affect single muscles, we want to do a series of movements. So I'm just going to check your powers, if that's okay. So we're going to start off at the top and work down. So we'll get the patient to put their arms up by their shoulders. They'll push us down and we'll push them up to confirm that we've got ab and adduction. They will flex and extend the elbow. And same flex and extend the wrist. And we can also look at movement of the fingers and the grip. We can also check for ab and adduction of the thumb. So a good one there is um, stop me pushing your thumb up, stop me pushing your thumb down. And in all ways, you're going to be trying to oppose them with similar muscle groups to ensure it's a fair test. We've highlighted the upper motor neurons. Um, they cause weakness, but that tends to be in large muscle groups. Okay, And good examples that you may see with this are a stroke causing pyramidal weakness, where we'll get weakness to uh, the extensors rather than the flexors in the upper motor neuron lesions of the upper limb. Having checked powers, we need to assess reflexes. So we've all come across reflexes in the past, but how would we define it? A reflex is defined as an unlearned, rapid, involuntary and predictable response. The classic one being we touch our fingers against a hot pan and we immediately pull back our hand. That requires five features in order to work. We need a sensory receptor, so the fingertips experiencing the pain, the sensory neuron transmitting the pain, the integration centre in the spinal cord, the motor neuron sending back the signal and the effector target bringing the muscle up. 
So reflexes are easily testable and allow us to uh, compare that all this is functioning. With a lower motor neuron lesion, we lose the whole reflex because there's no, there's, there is a break in that uh, five-step chain. With an upper motor neuron lesion, we get increased reflexes. Why could that be? Well, this is likely due to loss of inhibition coming down from the central nervous system. With the normal reflex, as that goes into the spine and the integration center, there's actually two processes that go on. The alpha motor neuron causing the response in our target muscle is activated. But there is also the activation of an inhibitory alpha motor neuron to switch off the opposing muscle to allow maximum speed and contractility getting you out of harm's way. It's thought because we've had the upper motor neuron lesion, we've lost an additional um, suppression, thus reflexes are going to be much sharper. And we can see that with Parkinson's disease. The substantia nigra is there for our pattern generation, more importantly, inhibition of abnormal movements. So as the substantia nigra gets damaged in Parkinson's, we end up with increased tone, which we see as an abnormal gait. We also get our tremor, our pill rolling um, tremor, because we aren't able to inhibit these movements. So that supports the theory of the increased reflexes due to loss of upper motor neuron inhibition. So there are two types of reflexes that we broadly need to consider, but only one are we going to test. We have somatic reflexes, those simple skeletal muscle reflexes that we, we will assess, but also we have visceral reflexes. So a good example of a visceral reflex is you stand up, you've got up too quickly, you've gone a little bit lightheaded because your blood pressure has dropped down ever so slightly. The baroreceptors or pressure receptors in your neck note that reduction in um, pressure, so cause your heart rate to go up and your heart to beat more forcefully, increasing up the pressure. Thankfully, we don't routinely test things like that, but we stay with the somatic skeletal muscle reflexes. In terms of the reflexes, we're going to use a tendon hammer, of which there are multiple different types. The two classic ones that you'll come across will be uh, the Taylor hammer, and the Queen's uh, square hammer. The Taylor hammer is probably the earlier of the hammers, um, invented in 1881, um, after um, the doctor had seen um, previous chest hammers. Now the chest hammer came about as um, a Dr. Leopold Aubruger, I think I've pronounced it correctly, would watch his father working as a hotel manager tapping down on barrels of wine to work out where the level is. And he considered that it may be possible to do the same, making a chest hammer to assess um, the patient's um, internal organs. Now, yes, we do still uh, percuss the chest, but we use fingers rather than hammers now because they weren't shown to be particularly useful. But those hammers have evolved into the tendon hammers that have a very different function now. I'm personally quite a fan of uh, the Taylor hammer. We've got a nice broad flat edge which is good for the broad reflexes such as at the knee or at the elbow. However, the apex there is very effective for deep tendons such as the bicep or over the carpal tunnel. Now, a comparison is made with the Queen's um, square hammer. This actually initially started off life as um, a, basically a homemade tool by one of the nurses who worked in the National Hospital of Nervous Diseases, Queen's Square London, which is where the name comes from. She took a pessary, put it on a brass uh, weight, which she then attached to a bamboo stick and found that she was able to reliably induce reflexes with it. Now, we use these classically at medical school, but also going further, because these can be very effective because they allow 10 newton metres of force to be generated with their simple drop from on high. With the Taylor hammer, you have to be ever so slightly more cautious, simply because you've not got that same degree of movement with it. But the Queen's Road hammer obviously has slightly less um, 
focus to its movement, but both are equally valid tools. In terms of testing the reflex, we need to ensure the patient is calm at rest because we want to try and have no active tone in their muscles. So we're going to place our thumb over the biceps tendon, as an example, because we don't want to hurt the patient, and strike directly onto our, our bicep. Now, we may find that we're unable to generate a reflex, in which case we want to try reinforcing actions. So getting the patient to close their eyes and grit their teeth, which then may allow us to increase that reflex. If we're trying to do the same with the lower limbs, we've got an additional movement we can do by getting the hands, getting the patient to close their eyes and pull apart. This reinforcing reflex can be particularly useful. And again, when comparing all the um, reflexes, we need to get the patient to try and relax as much as they can to allow us to hold their arm so that there is minimal tone there. I often find that patients have difficulty with this. So it can be a case that after a couple of tries, it is worthwhile leaving the patient and coming back again shortly afterwards. In terms of the upper limb reflexes, we want to do the biceps reflex, we want to do the supinator reflex, and we want to do the triceps reflex. In some uh, cases, it can be worthwhile doing a finger jerk reflex as well, but that isn't commonly looked at. Reflexes can use the same um, dermatomal map as we've had for power, and if there's a problem with the reflex, then we're going to be able to trace that back to particular nerve roots that have been affected. That's particularly the case in a lower motor neuron lesion where an absent reflex can be traced back. Remember, we're looking at much more focal issues there. At medical school, there's a simple phrase that allows us to remember our reflexes. S1, S2, put on a shoe. Three, four, stamp on the floor. Five, six, pick up sticks. Seven, eight, close the gate. So what that's looking at is that S1, 2 is at the ankle reflex. Three, four is the knee jerk reflex. 7, 8, close the gate, is our tricep reflex, and 5, 6, pick up sticks, is our biceps. Moving on, having done appearance, tone, power, and reflexes, we need to check sensation. This is going to be done with soft touch, so cotton wool or um, tissue paper, superficial pain using a neurotip, Sometimes patients will check temperature, but realistically this is often done just by can they feel the cool of the tuning fork that is also going to be used for vibration, and we'll check joint position and proprioception. In terms of sensation, patients can often say that they are numb. We need to clarify exactly what that means, and there's certain vocabulary that's important to be aware of. So pins and needles, meaning paresthesia. Diesthesia, meaning unpleasant pins and needles. Hyperesthesia, reduced sensation. Analgesia, the complete loss of sensation. Remember, that's what we're trying to do with painkillers and analgesics. We're trying to remove that pain. We're trying to get rid of that sensation. With that, we have hyperesthesia, that will be an increased sensitivity. And hyperalgesia, an increased sensitivity specifically to pain. It's also allodynia, which is painful stimuli from a non-painful stimulus, where something's going wrong clearly with the wiring. So in terms of sensation, we want to be touching up and down, up and down, up and down. We don't want to stroke the patient. The reason being is we don't want to get increased numbers of sensory fibres firing. We just want that straightforward up and down, up and down. Broadly, we're going to test over the shoulder tip, the deltoid, um, the inner and outer aspect of the arm, the thumb, little finger, and the back of the arm as well. Again, these boundaries um, aren't absolute, um, but if we find an area of altered sensation, we want to make sure that we map that out. And as we're doing that, we're going to be checking the opposite side of the body, and we need to make sure that the patient can't predict where it is we're going to be assessing next. In terms of vibration, we want to use a 128 hertz tuning fork. To begin, we strike it and place the tuning fork on the patient's chest, the theory being that the patient should be able to feel vibration here. If the patient is unable to feel the vibration at the chest, we're certainly not going to be able to find vibration at any of the peripheral regions, and we know that patient has a lot of unfortunate problems. 
In terms of examinations, we want to check distally to proximally on the bony prominences. So we'll start off on the fingertip. If the patient can't feel vibration here, we're going to move up to the um, distal interphalangeal joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints, and up to the metacarpal phalangeal joints. We'll continue up to the wrist, the elbow, and the shoulder tip before looking over the clavicle, trying to find somewhere where the patient is able to detect the vibration. Finally, we need to look at proprioception and coordination. Proprioception is uh, the knowledge of the position of your body in space and the strength employed in that movement. In terms of assessing proprioception, we need to start off on the upper limb with the fingers, holding the lateral sides of the finger on either side, not on the pulp and over the nail, because that increased pressure there can help the patient determine where the finger is being held. And we're going to demonstrate upwards and downward movement of the distal interphalangeal joint with the patient's eyes open. We'll then get them to close their eyes, we'll do the same again, and we're going to get them to determine where they can feel the fingertip in terms of position. Is it up or down? If the patient again is unable to identify proprioception of the fingertip, we're going to continue moving more proximally until the patient is able to identify the joint position sense. Coordination is the act of having muscles move together in concert to perform intentional smooth movements. Um, a good example here, testing coordination and also activities of daily living, is get the patient to do up a button or tie their shoelaces. In order to be able to effectively perform coordinated movements, we need to have good sensory input, good muscle function, and good co higher function coordination. So a simple test like opening buttons or checking shoelaces tests quite a lot with the patient, but also allows us to assess how the patient is likely able to cope and what impact their condition is going to be having on their quality of life. Other testing that we can do is with a finger nose test. So get the patient to stretch their arm out as far as they can and you raise your finger to meet them. It's important that that arm is stretched all the way out because if not, then we may find that they're able to compensate or suppress certain errors, which may be more evident at full extension. We're going to get the patient to do, put their finger to their nose and back to our finger quickly as they can, but as doing so, on the return journey, once we've established one or two normal movements, we will be able to move our finger as well and increase the difficulty of that test. Here, we may be looking for pass pointing, so the patient trying to touch our fingertip and missing and going beyond our finger. Other examinations that we can do will be DDK, checking for dystocodyskinesia. I hate that phrase, really have difficulty saying it. In terms of the DDK, we're checking back to front, back to front, back to front, and we want to make sure we're doing both sides, checking for the coordination and getting them to alternate as quickly as possible. Now, we can make that a little bit easier to start off with by getting the patient to do just simple tapping first and then move on to the DDK part of the assessment because if the patient is unable to do the simple tapping, it's unlikely that they're going to get good uh, coordination for their DDK. For the, upper neuro, uh, for the upper limb neurological assessment, we can also check for carpal tunnel, which allows me to go back to um, the, um, the Taylor hammer, whereupon we can use the apex to strike, if desired, directly over the carpal tunnel. And in doing so, it's just hitting that with myself. I obviously am right-handed and have spent a little bit too long working at the computer. So that strike there directly over the nerve is giving me a little bit of tingling on the thumb, the index and the middle finger. That being the distribution of the median nerve showing a positive Tynnels test. You can attempt to do Tynnels test by simply tapping over there, but personally I find the Taylor hammer to provide a more focused, effective examination because of the weight there. We also have Phelan's test, where we're putting additional stress on the carpal tunnel, bringing the elbows and hands and wrists to 90 degrees, straining the carpal tunnel and having the patient sat in that position for 60 seconds. That can also be further enhanced with a reverse Phelan's, again, 
looking for that same tingling in the median nerve distribution. Well, I hope that's been an effective run through on uh, the upper limb neurological examination. Um, as I say, it's a very complex examination um, in terms of the underlying science behind it. But as you've seen, the actual performance is much simpler. Um, so hopefully it's something that you can build on at home as long as you're understanding um, the underlying science behind it. Thanks very much for watching this far. I appreciate that this has been one of the longer videos. Um, if you'd be kind enough to give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you think it's been useful. And uh, we'll see you for the next clinical examination deep dive. Take care.